you know, what we know about Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, in their own currency, they're the same. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. One ETH is one ETH, right? But we don't price in Bitcoin or ETH. Right. We price in other things. We price in dollars or yen or euros or bolivars. I would say, you know, there's never been a bear market in Bitcoin in bolivars or in Turkish <laughs> lira or in Argentinian pesos. It's only dollars because of the ebb and flow of, of the business cycle. And so my, my issue on Ethereum here is... Uh, look, I think we're in a, a summer doldrums, short covering kind of market. Um, you know, what's interesting about, about bull markets and bear markets, you know, there's never been, Paul, in, in all the time we've, we've had markets, there's never been a 4% up day in a bull market. Right. That doesn't happen, right? Because a bull market is a market that goes up most days, a little bit, but goes down sharply on bad news or perceived bad news. A bear market, conversely, goes down most days and then goes up sharply on good news or perceived good news. So a couple weeks ago, we had a 4% up day in, in NASDAQ. Why? Well, because Microsoft came in, missed revenues, missed earnings, but said, oh, you know, I know we only grew 3% you know, this, this quarter, but, but really by the end of the year, we're gonna be back to 12. Like yeah. based on what? Based yeah. on 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 what? I mean, GDP numbers are coming in light. Growth is collapsing. Uh, earnings usually follow growth. So it was just amazing to watch. And so, look, this summer, I don't know if you've been out and about, but this summer, no one's working. When there's low volume in markets, you can get these kind of short, squeezy days on perceived good news. So you asked the question about inflation. CPI is kind of a silly number. So over the last two years, really over the last you know 18 months or so, uh, the Fed created half of all the dollars in the history of the Republic. 248 oh, yeah. years, they created half. So theoretically, the dollar should have weakened uh, about 50%, okay? And Bitcoin price should have risen 100%. Almost, over the last two years, Bitcoin's up almost exactly 100%. Mm -hmm. And so it reflected all of the inflation that we were going to see over the past year in real time. So people who look at CPI numbers, they're just, they're looking in the rear view mirror. The road's already turned and they're about to fly off the cliff. Yeah, you know, look, the, the Fed has no impact on inflation, right? They and and people say oh, that's ridiculous. Well, it, it's just what's the perceived fact, right? impact. No matter, no matter what they do with the Fed funds rate, because the Fed funds rate is is a rate that really has nothing to do with reality. In the sense that, do you borrow at Fed funds? Do I borrow at Fed funds? Do the listeners, right. you know, borrow at Fed funds? No, no one borrows at Fed funds. The only people that borrow at Fed funds are banks, and the Fed funds rate was kept artificially low for a dozen years, why? Yeah. To reliquify the banks after the global financial crisis. They basically were given free access to money that they could turn around and buy treasuries because no one else wants to buy treasuries because there's too many of them because we're you know spending like drunken sailors in, in DC. And because of that, what they do with interest rates, whether they raise them or lower them, it really isn't gonna change inflation. Everybody's going to say, oh, look, you know, Jay Powell broke the back of inflation like like Volcker. No, he didn't. That decline in inflation has nothing to do with interest rates. It has to do with the fact that oil prices ran unnaturally. The other part of inflation print was, was used car prices. That's a long-winded way of saying what the Fed does really has very little to do with inflation because what we're experiencing is not inflation. It's not demand pull inflation. It's not that we have excess demand and limited supply. It's we devalued the currency. I use housing prices here in North Carolina sure. as the best example. Yep. Housing prices over the last year went up 40%, four zero in one year. Did my house get bigger? Did it grow? Did it get more efficient? Did it somehow get better? No, it actually wore out. I had to put money into it to keep it at the same level. But what happened is the money that people use to buy 
houses got devalued because they printed too much of it. And the Fed isn't going to change the number of dollars in the world by changing the Fed funds rate. Full stop. Everyone says the dollar is so strong. The dollar's not strong. The dollar is just less weak than the yen and the euro. It's not strong mm -hmm. versus the renminbi. It's not strong versus the ruble. It's not strong versus gold. It's not strong versus Bitcoin. It's just not strong. So it's less weak than these other toilet paper currencies. The whole markets, the whole economies collapse if you try to take that funny money, because it really is funny money. I mean, it's money created out of thin air. And part of it is, that's the plan. I mean, I, yeah. I, I hate to say it that starkly, but that has been the plan since 1913. The Fed was created to create inflation. Inflation is a myth, right? Inflation is not good for the average person. Think about it. If inflation increases a couple percent a year over a 25 year period, half yeah. of your purchasing power is destroyed. Gone. Why is that good for me? Yeah. It's not. It's really good for the people at the tippy top. And it's why we have the greatest wealth and income inequality in the history of the world. And it's because for better part of a hundred and some odd years, 109 years, the Fed has quietly been stealing the wealth of the masses and siphoning it up to the tippy top. And here's a factoid that no one talks about, actually makes me really angry, in the lockdowns, right? But in that period, instead of things getting better on this front, three and a half trillion dollars with a T, trillion, three and a half trillion of wealth went from the average person to the elite class, the yeah. owners, the super majority owners of these little tiny oligopolies. And that is part of the plan, right? I, I, I actually believe it was the plan all along. Inflation shouldn't exist. It's, it's not something we should hope for. The Federal Reserve is neither federal, right? It's not yeah. federal. It's not owned by the government. It's not a government agency. It has no full faith and credit. It right. is owned, as you said, by prime brokers and, and banks. Uh, it is not, it has no reserves, right? It's not like a normal bank where there are actually reserves. And, and it's basically about price fixing. They price fix an interest rate that should be set by the market. The market right. should yeah. determine interest rates. All well, price fixing of any kind is bad. People think it's good if it benefits them, like if they live in a rent controlled apartment or if, if they're on minimum wage, but minimum wage is a form of price fixing. And you should let the market determine the fair wage, the proper wage. I, I do think we are in a recession. I think it's, it's a recession very similar to 2001, which was a very shallow recession. And the good thing is markets corrected, you know, markets were down about 12% and it flushed out the fraud. Enron, WorldCom, you know, Cisco with their, their bad marks on their inventory yeah. and a whole bunch of stuff then came out and 2002 was a really bad year for the markets, down 22%. Mm -hmm. And that was the final crush uh, until the first quarter of 03 when, when we invaded Iraq and, and turned the, the markets around. You know, what we know about Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, in their own currency, they're the same. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. One ETH is one ETH, right? But we don't price in Bitcoin or ETH. Right. We price in other things. We price in dollars or yen or euros or bolivars. I would say, you know, there's never been a bear market in Bitcoin in bolivars or in Turkish lira, <laughs> or in Argentinian pesos. It's only dollars because of the ebb and flow of, of the business cycle. And so my, my issue on Ethereum here is it could be a buy the rumor, sell the news. Right. right? We've had a huge move off the bottom, almost 100%. Mm -hmm. And you know, Bitcoin's only up about 45. And I will argue that you know winter's over. We're in crypto spring. Crypto spring lasts six to nine months. We're probably you know, month and a half in, and then you get crypto summer where you get the next parabolic move in anticipation of the halving. I don't have the answer for, are we gonna have a single chain world with Bitcoin as the base, lightning, and then layer threes and fours, or are we gonna have a multi-chain world with Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, Avalanche, sure. leaning more toward a multi-chain world? Uh, and I'm, you know, probably think that's more likely, but the maxis, do make a very <laughs> elegant case 
for why everything should be built on Bitcoin. Proof of work is far superior to proof of stake. I believe that 100%. Um, so look, it's, it's a complicated issue. Uh, we do own both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, I'm not as overweight Bitcoin probably as I used to be. People come back to work and then they look at it and say, geez, this really is bad. And, and yeah. Q3 GDP really is not looking good. And so, so in the traditional markets, I think the fall is going to be painful. You know, October is the cruelest month and all that good stuff. Crypto, I think the lows are in. I think the lows were, were mid-June. Uh, I think we've made a series of higher lows. Uh, we're in accumulation pattern. You know, we are in a distribution pattern all the way through June 14th. Uh, we had that cathartic drop from 30,000 down to 175. Uh, I think that's it. And now, you know, 24,000 level in Bitcoin is kind of the new accumulation resistance. And we're making this ascending triangle and these lower, these higher lows. Uh, as soon as we break through 24, uh, I think we're off to the races. And I would be accumulating uh, digital assets and I would be uh, liquidating traditional assets. And, and I was on a, a network TV uh, a couple weeks ago and, and the host asked me, she said, you know, shouldn't we be buying these, these cheap tech stocks? I said, well, here's the thing. <laughs> yeah, tech stocks are down 30% at the time and they're, sure. they're up 10% since then. But I said, here's the thing. Even with that, they're still in the top 7% most overvalued in their history. Right. So 140 years of data, they've only been more expensive 7% of the time. Bitcoin, which was about 18,000 at the time, I said has only been cheaper 2% of the time. Now it's only 14 mm -hmm. years, not 140 years, but that's a long trend. So I'm just gonna bet that buying something in the cheapest 2%, now we're in the cheapest 5%, is better than buying something in the most expensive 93 percent that's just me well it, the high school wrestler and uh my coach had these two funny sayings so one you know you'd be out there and guy would have you in a headlock and you'd say i, I can't breathe coach he'd say if you can talk you can breathe I'm like yeah it's probably true um but the second one is like look where the head goes the body follows so you want someone's body to move to the left side of the mat put their head over there and the body will follow and if economic growth is slowing which it clearly is, yep. earnings are not going to rise. It's just where the head goes, the body follows. And earnings are going to fall. And that means stocks are probably uh, overvalued. Uh, 